Welcome to a new episode of the Beginner's Mind podcast today with a special guest from the United States, Len Herstein. Len, welcome to the show. Thanks, Christian. Good to be here. Good to see you. Len, where are you from exactly in the United States? Well, that's a complicated question. I live in Colorado. I live in Colorado, just south of Denver, Beautiful. Uh, but I'm from the East Coast. I'm from New York originally. How is life in Colorado these days? It's great. It's great. I mean, you know, like it's as good as life could be anywhere right now with everything that's going on. Right. But uh, but yeah, we've, we've been lucky here and, and things have uh, remained for the most part very open. And uh, so it's uh, and this is a beautiful time of year. We get our snows and we get our um, we get our sunshine and it's a nice mix. How is the weather currently? Is it uh, still snowy or do you feel spring coming already? No, we got a little while till spring, but uh, the good thing for us is that, you know, where I live, we only get a few snows, you know, that are worth shoveling each year. That's how I measure a snow. If I don't have to shovel, it doesn't <laughs> count. But uh, so, you know, we, we have one coming tonight. I think we have one coming tonight. The kids are kind of excited. They think they might get a snow day tomorrow. So we'll see. Yeah, I believe that I'm from Austria and uh, we have some snowy days here as well in winter. Yeah. Currently, people are uh, skiing, but yeah. in a couple of weeks in March, uh, we're going back to spring and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, the, the interesting thing that people don't realize about here is that we, um, you know, we actually get the majority of our snow like in April. You know, like we get, really? we get late snows. It's not, it, but it's beautiful because it's, it's, you know, like spring skiing is You know, like you could be out skiing in shorts, you know, because it's it's <laughs> sunny and it's nice, but you still got snow on the ground. So we didn't do that great with snow this year. So I don't I don't know how the mountains are doing uh, right now with with the skiing and stuff. But um, yeah, we'll get snow into April. Oh, that's awesome! I just try to imagine how it looks like uh, skiing in shorts. I'm more used yeah. to, 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 full, <laughs> to full equipment here in Austria. Uh, the yeah. majority of snow I experience here in uh, around Vienna, I think, is uh, until February, and in March is going away. But in the mountains, there are also some um, possibilities to ski until April and May, but uh, mm. very high in the mountains. Yeah. yeah. Len, let's jump into the topic of uh, today's webinar. It's your book, which I have. Let me just. <laughs> find the title page on my ipad and i hope it works to flash it in the camera yeah there it is the vigilant which always reminds me a little bit of the marvel universe with the uh, <laughs> i think there is this there's this character group of uh, vigilantes how they call is that it right? or, yeah yeah it's uh, it's a funny thing and when i started reading your book uh, it helped me to get my mind straight towards a major one of the major questions i had in my life um, when I look at the world's population, I think the majority of the world's population still are not millionaires. Mm. And there are a few billionaires in the world, very few, I think 2,500 or so, uh, according to the latest Forbes billionaire list. And I always wondered why are there some people like uh, Elon Musk, for example, or Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett, who create incredible wealth while the majority of the human race is just uh, purely struggling with uh, getting money straight and getting their businesses straight. Yeah. And there are a lot of explanations in the world, uh, which I don't like. So some say, okay, we are victims of a, a huge system and there's a conspiracy going on. We can I think, dump that. Um, I think that the truth is that probably it's a very special skill set. And mm. When I opened your book, uh, I got a really great idea right delivered on the first pages by the intro from a nice lady. Let me just, uh, Melissa, Melissa Agnes, founder and CEO, yeah. Crisis Ready Institute. And you play in your book with two terms. So one is complacency and uh, what is the other word? Can you, can you explain? Vigilance. It or vigilance. vigilance. Uh, what do you mean with that? Yeah. So, you know, complacency is an interesting term because, um, you know, what I found is it's become kind of a throwaway word in society. People use it a lot. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, F, you know, any, anybody in your audience who hears this interview afterwards, you'll start hearing it. You'll hear it today. You'll see it in the news. Um, someone will say it at work. You'll, you know, you're watching a sporting event and the, and the announcer will say something. And basically, you know, we, we say, you know, we say like, Hey, let's not get complacent or stop. You know, we can't get complacent out there. And, and, you know, nobody ever talks about what it means. And a lot of people assume that it means laziness, that it kind of equates to laziness. But, you know, for me, 
complacency is not laziness. Complacency is an over when we develop an overconfidence, a self-satisfaction, a smugness that goes along with success that makes us unaware of potential or real dangers and threats. And that's when we become complacent. And that's the irony of complacency is that, you know, and it's kind of what, what you know, kind of the, the route that you're going is that complacency is born from success. The more mm-hmm. successful we are, the more vulnerable we become to complacency. And so that is, that is why complacency is so insidious. It's so, you know, it's so dangerous to us because it attacks us without us seeing it. And it comes along because we're, we're enjoying success. That's, that's an amazing thought. I mean, when I look in at my circle of business acquaintances and also when I open the newspapers, um, it really seems that a lot of people get on the right track mm-hmm. and start acquiring skills and building their business or making a career. And at one point in time, uh, they just dip into this, this uh, what you call complacency, that they get overconfident, they are successful, and they are not paying attention anymore. Did you find during, during your research the reasons why that happens? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, again, the, you know, the, the biggest reason is that we become overconfident that we think we have it all figured out. And there's a lot of things that go along with that. We lose sight of competition. We lose, we lose sight or we, we become too focused on certain competition and lose sight of what is coming from the sides or, 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 you know, from places that we can't see. We, you know, especially in small business, we become kind of territorial about everything. We don't want to give up any control. And that creates a situation where we can create organizational complacency um, because people are not engaged. And we're seeing a lot of that right now with the great resignation and everything that's going on here in, in the U.S. with people leaving their jobs. A lot of that is born from, you know, corporate complacency around their, their workforce. You know, we find that, you know, the, when we enjoy success, we also come what comes along with that a lot of times is power. And what happens is a lot of times people will and organizations will abuse that power without even realizing it. Um, and that's, you know, that's something I talk in the book is, is how do we make sure that we're always able to articulate our why? Why are we doing everything that we're doing? And when the answer is because I can or because I said so, those are bad answers. That, that's when we get into a situation where we're creating, you know, a complacent environment for ourselves. So there's a lot of different reasons. It was all kind of born from, you know, seven years ago at the ripe age of 45, I, I got into law enforcement for the first time in my life. So I started to become, I, I went through academy and, and became a volunteer uh, deputy uh, with the sheriff's office. And, and I go out and I do patrol. But that's what kind of prompted this whole thing is that I learned that complacency kills. And we talk a lot about that in law enforcement. Um, but then I started thinking, you know what? Complacency kills businesses. It kills brands. It kills uh, professional and personal relationships. And that's when I really started to dig, in, dig into what do we do in law enforcement to help us fight complacency every day? And how can we translate that back to business and life? And that, that's, what, that's what the book is. The book is all about you know, 10 specific things you can start doing right now to identify and fight complacency with vigilance. And that was something you and I were talking about uh, before we, we went live is that, you know, a lot of times people get a little um, overwhelmed with, because they believe that the opposite of complacency is paranoia. We've got to be mm-hmm. looking over our shoulders all the time, you know, and that's, that's not the case. It, it, you don't fight complacency with paranoia, but you do fight it with vigilance. And the difference is that paranoia is fear-based and vigilance is awareness base. And that's what this is all about. It's all about being aware, intentional, in the moment, and purposeful. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, truth in it, what you're saying. I mean, I'm just thinking about the, the, these billionaires and billionaire entrepreneurs like Elon Musk. Uh, whenever I read something about them, they emphasize that uh, they're basically constantly working, working on improving themselves and their organizations. I think also Ray Dalio in his book uh, expresses something similar. He talks about the machine that uh, should always be improved. And uh, you mentioned your why. Uh, I think uh, Simon Sinek is one of uh, those who wrote the book who said, start with mm-hmm. why. 
Let's go back to your book. Uh, you mentioned that you started out in uh, law enforcement. Can you give a little bit more insight into complacency in the law enforcement environment? How does it look like? Yeah, so it, it's it's particularly um, uh, applicable to law enforcement because law enforcement is the type of place where we are, you know, things go right 98% of the time. You know, our, our day-to-day is a lot of things that are, fairly routine to us, you know, the same types of calls, traffic stops, you know, going to, you know, cold calls about thefts and frauds and, you know, and, and, you know, drug things and, and all that. So, you know, what happens to us and what we have to be careful about is that, you know, when you do a a traffic stop and you pull over a car and you pull and you do that thousands of times and nothing ever goes wrong, you can start, getting a little lackadaisical, right? You can start, you know, walking up to the car in a way that is unsafe or dealing with someone in the car in a way that's unsafe or, you know, losing sight of what's around you because you've done it so many times and you've had so much success that you think that you, that what you're doing is leading to that success. And that's what we call survivorship bias. So survivorship bias means that because we've had success in the past and because we've made it through some you know, gate or criteria, we feel like the reason we got through all that is because of what we did. Right. So you might see like memes on like, you know, social media that says, you know, you know, I survived, you know, spankings and lead paint and, (laughs) you know, and the secondhand smoke and riding around in cars with no seatbelts, you know, like if you did too. Well, here's the thing. If you didn't survive those things, you're not around to like, right. So only the people who survived, can like. And so you get a warped view of what reality is. Um, And that's, that's a big problem for us in law enforcement is, you know, we can deviate from our training that's meant to keep us safe and keep everybody else safe because of all the success that we enjoy. And then when something goes wrong, it usually goes really wrong, really quickly. And so that's, that's where we learn, you know, how to do things. And these are the strategies that I then adapt for business and life. How can we do specific things to make sure that we remain aware, that we remain in the moment, that we don't lose sight of the potential threats because of the success that we've had? What is your major recommendation? I mean, complacency, I think theoretically it can be understood quite easily, but then it's uh, daily life. As you say, I mean, as a law enforcement officer, uh, 98% everything goes right, and then you have this 2% where something changes. Uh, What advice, what is the the most important advice you would give someone in the business environment to say, okay, I mean, I built my business, I am successful, so everything is going really well, and why should I change anything? What is the best advice that you would give someone to say, okay, watch out because. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, what, what you were just saying in terms of things that always go right. Why, why would I change anything? You know, a, a friend of mine, he's also an author. His name is Tom Asacker. You know, everybody's aware of uh, Einstein's, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, the definition of insanity, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Doing the same thing, you know, over and over and expecting different results. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, Tom's definition is a little bit different. It's, it's, you know, his definition of insanity, especially in this world is doing the same thing over and over and expecting the same results, right? Because things are changing so fast, right? That, and this is what, this is what we get into in business. We're like, Hey, we did, this is the way we've been doing it. We got to keep doing it. But the problem is that everybody else is around us is changing. Our competition Mm -hmm. is changing. Our customers, our consumers are changing. Our vendors are changing. Our employees are changing. And so to do the same thing over and over and expect the same results is literally insane because it just can't happen. So one of the, you know, there, like I said, there's 10 things in a book. I I would say one of the most important ones, and it's one of those, you know, the first chapters in the book is this idea of threat awareness, Mm-hmm. right? It's, it's always remaining aware of the potential threats out there. And in business, how that plays out a lot of times is that we get so comfortable, we get so overconfident in terms of who our competition is. If we're Coke, our competition is Pepsi. If we're, you know, Apple, our competition is, you know, Microsoft, it, you know, nothing anymore, so. right? Not anymore. Right. But, but in the day, that's how people thought in those businesses. And what happens is we get what's called what I call the roadrunner effect. I don't know. Do you, are you familiar with the roadrunner cartoon uh, yes, at all? Absolutely. absolutely, you know, beep, absolutely. Beep, right. 
Yeah, so yeah. you've got the Roadrunner and you got Wiley Coyote. Coyote. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Well, Wiley Coyote got such tunnel vision on who his competition was, the Roadrunner, right? Mm -hmm. But where did all the danger for Wiley Coyote come from? Did it ever come from the Roadrunner? No. Not it came really. from all the things around them that he missed, mm -hmm. right? And that's what happens in business is we can get so comfortable with who our competition is that we lose sight of what's changing around us and we lose sight of where these new dangers can come from. So one of the things that I talk to businesses about is how do you set up an internal structure that allows you to remain aware of the ever-changing threat landscape, right? And threat is a, you know, it, it, sometimes that could be a word that triggers people a little bit, you know, but, but it's, it's not as dangerous as it sounds, but you, but you have to, you know, maintain awareness. You have to have someone in your organization or people within your organization whose job it is to find out where those next threats could be coming from so that we can plan for them ahead of time. One of the things I talk about is this idea that the worst time to figure out what you're going to do in a crisis is when you're in the crisis. And this is what we do. We do a lot of what we call scenario planning, yeah. right? It's a lot of do... lots, lot of your activeness. Uh, you brought up the example Apple. Um, I think this explains very well uh, what complacency is. When I think back to 2006, um, the majority of the mobile industry was in Europe. So it was, mm -hmm. I think, Nokia, Siemens, uh, Ericsson, for example, or Sony from Japan. Yeah. Um, they divided the market amongst them evenly, I would say. Mm -hmm. And who would have thought that that would ever change? When I look now on the mobile industry or the smartphone industry, I mean, we have Apple, this iPhone. Yeah. And Samsung. I think nobody of the young uh, generation knows even Nokia anymore or Ericsson or what was the name of the Canadian company? The Blackberry. Uh, Blackberry, yes. They are all... They are all Of, they got all of the market and uh, when I remember the first presentation of Steve Jobs when he presented the iPhone I thought what is he doing the world doesn't need another uh, mobile no. phone we have enough right. already and the market is oversaturated um, 20 years later or not a little bit less than 20 years later our trademarks are gone what could they have done differently in your opinion Oh man, I think there's a lot. I think I think that 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 is a rough question because there's there's a lot they could have done differently. It's hard to boil it down to just one specific mm -hmm. thing, right? But I do think that complacency played a role, right? So there there's a number of different places that that you can probably tie it into, right? One is threat awareness. Mm -hmm. Did they did they see where the you know everybody was you know was thinking about like the biggest innovation we had in cell phones and mobile for a long time is when, you know, Motorola created a, a flip phone, right? Yeah. You know, the StarTac, I think. I it was remember called, those right? days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that was the big thing. Nobody ever thought like where, you know, this is going to become the computer that we, that we carry around with us. This is going to be touchscreen. And, you know, if, if you had told somebody that they were going to carry around a phone, you know, this big, with them back then people, you know, the whole thing was like, look how small this phone is. This is great. I can fit it in my, you know, in my, in my pinky, you know, we can mm -hmm. open it up and do this right <laughs> now. Now, now people carry around, you know, the phones get bigger every year. They don't get smaller every year. Right. And so, you know, part of that is, is understanding who your competition is and where that competition will be coming from. You mentioned Elon Musk, you know, how many people in the solar industry like thought that their biggest competition was going to come from Tesla, a car company? Yeah, right? it's, the it's the same with the automotive industry. I mean, combustion engine, it's also the German car makers, uh, Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes. Um, think talking to them 10 years ago, nobody thought that electric vehicles uh, would win the race or that Elon Musk, I mean, Uh, many people laughed about Elon Musk until 2018 and said, I mean, this company is going bust pretty soon, so don't invest in that company and everything changed. Um, yeah. but what, what, what's the one thing that you would emphasize and say, okay, these people are doing this one thing differently, like Elon Musk and uh, Steve Jobs? You know, it's interesting uh, because I don't know. You know, I, I think there are these people who are super successful, right? Mm -hmm. that, we would, that we would call super successful. I, I think, you know, everybody has a different definition of what success is like. And, you know, you have to be willing to make trade-offs, 
you know, um, to have that level of success may not allow you to live the life that you actually want to live in terms of spending all the time you want with your children or, you know, and, you know, going out for strolls or, you know, going, you know, doing things that you want to do like, you know, to get to where they are, they gave up a lot along the way. So that's part of it. I think, I think, I think most of us don't have that appetite for success that they have where you're willing to give up basically almost everything else in order to get there. But I do think that what they, what they embody that I think ties back to what we're talking about is they don't rest on their laurels, right? They don't ever feel like, you know, we, we've got it all figured out and there's nothing to learn, right? They're always asking for more. They're always asking the next question. They're always achieving something and then setting their sights to achieve something different. So I, I do think that that is, you know, a big difference between most of us, because I think a lot of people enjoy that, get that success and then, you know, get very comfortable very quickly. I don't, I don't think Elon Musk ever gets comfortable doesn't look to me to get, I don't know him personally, but he doesn't ever look comfortable to me. Like he's yeah, always. I completely agree to what you say. I mean, first, it's the definition of success. So this is more or less an entrepreneurship and business podcast. So uh, this is the reason why I stay on the business side. But of course, I mean, um, there are other definitions of success outside the business world, like having friends and family and doing other things. Uh, but yeah. uh, I would love to stick uh, to my playgrounds, to the business playground. Um, when I look at Elon Musk, I think he, one day he said, I mean, uh, he was also asked the question about success and say, I mean, look, it's easy. I mean, I'm working 80 hours per week, seven days a week, uh, 365 <laughs> or 52 weeks per year. Who yeah. does want that? I mean, uh, this is uh, one thing that they need to do. And the second thing that you mentioned is uh, with this term complacency. Um, that he never rests on his laurels and he has built yeah. an entire system around him that is pretty much doing the same. And I think this makes a huge difference in the long run. Yeah. So this is here's and here's something that, that we can learn from it, right? So again, we can aspire to, you know, maintain our success without aspiring to be an Elon Musk, but we can learn, right? Mm -hmm. We can learn from him. We can learn from Jeff Bezos. What, one of the things that I always encourage people to do, and is part of this never kind of settling or accepting, you know, where you are is this idea of doing debriefs. So I talk about this in the book and, okay. you know, debriefs is some, a, a debriefing is something that we use a lot in law enforcement after, you know, things happen, right? We, we get together, we talk about what happened, but the difference in law enforcement and business and the way that we use it is in law enforcement, we do it regardless of outcome, right? So we do it, whether we have a perceived success or failure. And a lot of times in business, what we do is we only have debriefs of things that go wrong, right? We, something happens that goes, you know, the, the way that we didn't want to go, or we have a failure and we get everybody together. And what it really turns into is like, who's to blame? Like, how do we figure out who's, who's mm -hmm. to blame here? Where, where, where can we find fault? Right. But when we enjoy success, we don't spend the time going through what happened. Right. We move on. We pat ourselves on the back. We have a, you know, we have, we have a celebration and then we move on. But here's the thing, successful people that you're talking about, question everything right they they go back through the events that took place even if they turned out successfully and they look for what went well what went well but went well by accident what could have gone better where were our micro failures like we enjoyed success here but could we have been successful here right and how do we how do we figure that out and so you know there's there's certain things that make for a good debriefing um you know a couple of headlines is you know again number one doing it regardless of outcome positive or negative making sure that everybody knows we're going to do it ahead of time which makes people remain aware and in the moment and they pay more attention um and leaving titles at the door making sure that, you know, this is, you know, you don't get a debrief and you've got all the junior people sitting there and it's just the senior person telling them what they thought and everybody takes notes and goes off. That's not a debrief. That's a lecture, right? So, you know, debrief means everybody leaves their titles at the door. Everybody gets an equal say, everybody gets to participate. I have seven or eight things that, that I talk about in terms of what a successful debrief is, but those are, those are two or three right off the bat. But You know, and, you know, if you think about successful sports stars, so here in Denver, you know, we have a famous quarterback by the name of Peyton Manning, and everybody probably knows Tom Brady as a quarterback, right? 
These are people who, regardless of whether they won or lost, they're immediately going through the game. They're immediately going through all the plays to say, okay, we got 10 yards there. How could we have gotten 15? Right. And so mm-hmm. that is, that is something that I think anybody can do in business and in, in their, you know, as an entrepreneur or in their personal lives, I do it at home with my family. We have, you know, make sure we have family dinners. We're talking about things um, that, that have gone right and have gone wrong. Um, but that's something you can do right now that will help you emulate what successful people do, which is question everything, even when everything seemingly goes right. Uh, this is great advice. I read it for also from uh, the Navy SEALs mm-hmm. that after each mission, they do a debrief. And you also said it right uh, a couple of minutes ago that they leave their ranks outside the room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so everybody has an equal say. And I just imagine the typical European company um, Yeah. I'm not so 100% sure that the, that the ranks and the titles are really left outside of the deep, uh, yeah. in, a deep, in a deep brief. I think this is a, a key success factor. Also, uh, one of uh, the American investors that I admire, it's Jamal Fadi Habadir. He's uh, very frequently on the All In podcast. Uh, he also emphasizes this, uh, always ask questions and find the root cause of the problems. Don't yeah. settle with the first best answer. Always ask five whys more. Do you agree to that? Yeah. Be a child, right? Why, yeah. why, 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 why? Until, until you can't get any deeper. Yeah. And that, it's important. It's important. But and you mentioned, you know, the European companies not leaving tiles at the door, you know, you're missing a lot when you don't mm-hmm. do that. Right. Because a lot of times the freshest perspective, it comes from the newest person, yeah, right. The one that who, who hasn't been in the system, who, who doesn't like think in terms of, well, this is the way we've always done it. Right it doesn't that doesn't matter if you really want to get to what's going on that has to go away that's that's absolutely true that's absolutely true um you said you have uh, fleshed out some rules about a proper debrief uh, can you give us a little bit more insight what a proper debrief should look like in your opinion yeah so again you know a, a proper debrief is one that is not a surprise so this has to become part of your culture Right. You have to know that for, you know, any significant activities we do, we're going to have a debrief on the other end. And what that does is that forces people to think about, they know that they're going to be asked questions later. They know that they're going to have an opportunity, which forces them to remain in the moment and aware and not go on autopilot. Right. So that's number one is to know, you know, number one, set it up so that it's always going to happen again, regardless of outcome. This is not only when things go wrong. It's when things go right mm-hmm. as well. You know, the second thing that we already talked about is, is you know, making sure that you um, leave those titles at the door. You want to make sure that you also, you know, do this in a way that is actionable. We want to focus on what, you know, we've got the what, we've got the so what, and then we've got the now what, right? And a lot of times we just focus on the what, what went wrong, what, what happened, right? We got to focus next on the so what. Why does this matter, right? What, is, what does this mean to us? What are the implications? But the most important part is the now what? What are we going to do about it, right? We have to make this actionable. If we just get together and we talk about everything that went wrong and we point fingers and we blame and then we walk out of the room and nothing changes, then that's a waste. All mm-hmm. that does is that's just a morale, you know, that's just t- steals people, people's morale, Right. Yeah. So, that, yeah. I, I agree with that. I mean, at the end of the day, where before leaving the room, there should be an action. There should be something that people can really change and can work on. Just sitting there. I mean, pandemic, for example. Uh, I think many countries were really uh, caught off guard. Uh, let's let's call it that way. The pharma industry. I mean, I'm, I'm working in the life science industry now since yeah. 2006. It was pretty much under finance globally. So especially uh, developing solutions against viral diseases didn't get a lot of attention and a lot of money because, I mean, there are so few viral, uh, really uh, global threats to that. And with SARS-CoV-2, everything changed. Uh, of course, now we have these, uh, these, these hero companies, BioNTech and Moderna, for example, uh, or Pfizer, who, who saved the day. But they went through a lot of hardship because raising money for these technologies were really, really challenging. And uh, if, let's say, if the governments would have spent a little bit more time in assessing the situation, say, okay, I mean, we can 
probably there is a threat coming all the time. Um, we should do something against it. It maybe would have changed a little bit in, in the beginning. But the thing is, and uh, where you said, uh, when we miss out this action item, so we just sit there and blaming because now we can always say, okay, the government, it's the fault of the government, it didn't do anything. Uh, but for the future, I think uh, this is the important point that you mentioned. We need to drill down to the point that everybody can do, everybody can do daily. And uh, did I get that right from your explanation that this uh, creating action items really to tell the people or find the way, not really telling the people, but finding a way together, how we yeah. can change things makes a huge difference. Is that the right perception I got? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and I'll add one thing to that. The big question is, so right now, so you're talking about what we're going through right now and, and how we could have seen it coming and maybe been more prepared. And right now things are moving, right? We've, we've mm -hmm. been, in you know, the last couple of years, things have moved quickly and we've gotten a lot of funding and people have, you know, you mentioned some companies that have really, you know, uh, stepped up to the plate and, and done things. You know, one of the things I talk about though, is it's easy to be vigilant when you're in the middle of chaos. Yeah. Right. You don't, you know, you, you, you talk about, you, you know, your audience is entrepreneurial. You know, you, you talk to a lot of entrepreneurial people. You don't find a lot of complacent entrepreneurs who are bootstrapping their businesses, working out of their mom's garage and maxing out their credit cards. What you find is when, you know, when they get successful, that's when they become complacent. And so the big question for us coming out of what we're going through right now is what, ha you know, eventually we're going to get back to a place. Maybe we'll never get back to normal but mm -hmm. there's going to be a new normal. Right. And True. we'll get, you know, we'll get someplace. And as a, as a human race, we're good at getting comfortable. We, you know, our natural instinct is to want to be comfortable. And so we'll find a way to get comfortable again. And the question is what happens next? What happens two, three, four, five years ago? Have we learned and are we staying vigilant or do we get comfortable and everything kind of goes back to the way it was and we lose sight of the next threat coming that's the real question. That's a really good point. I mean, <clears throat> when, we, when, I, when we talk about the companies a little bit further, so in, I think until 2019, they had really hard times to find capital. Now they, are, they have sufficient capital in their balance sheet. And yep. um, I always thought, okay, I mean, they just need to continue what they are doing and it's pretty easy and they can be, become successful. But this is the point that you mentioned then. I mean, uh, there is no guarantee. There is at the end of the day no guarantee because I mean we are all human people and uh, when we are successful, probably it's a uh, it's a human flaw. It's uh, built in our DNA that uh, when we created success, we become a little bit lazy. But you would you don't like the term laziness. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean again, like I think I think you know it's, we can talk about it in terms of laziness, but I do mm -hmm. feel like you know that you know I don't love that word because it sounds so negative. You know, I mean mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think anybody's trying to do anything wrong or, or just, you know, like purposefully doing it. It just, it's human nature. Mm -hmm. It's human nature to want to find stasis. You want to, you want to be comfortable. You want to be balanced in, in all those things. And sometimes it's uncomfortable to think about what could go wrong. You know, it's, it's, it's much easier to just enjoy what's going right. Um, and so, you know, that, that's part of it. And that's, that's what I'm most concerned at. You know, I think we've seen it through these last, you know, what is it, two and a half years now that we've been going mm, through this? Mm, mm. You know, I think we've seen it, you know, we go, you know, what, what gets people sometimes is the highs and the lows, you know, it's like things are really bad, things are really bad, and then things are getting better and people get comfortable like, oh, okay, it's over, but it's yeah. not over. And then it comes back and then people, you know, because their expectations are not set properly, they get upset again. And, and it's, it's very, you know, taxing on people's, you know, energy to continually go through these ups and downs. But it's because, we want to so quickly get back to a level of comfort. Um, and that's, that's what we're fighting all the time. That's what we're fighting in law enforcement uh, all, every day. Every mm -hmm. day is, you know, our natural instinct is to get back to, you know, being comfortable. So one of the things that we can do to help fight that is to create these kind of processes in our lives and in our business that help eliminate some of the thought. So I talk about habit building, building habits to eliminate thought from things that the thought actually hurts us, mm -hmm. right? So quick example on a personal level, you know, when I walk in the house, every, every time I walk in the house, my keys come out of my pocket and they go in a specific place because thinking about where I'm going to put my keys each time 
makes it more likely I'm going to lose my keys, right? So if I walk in this time, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be going out in just a few minutes. I don't need to put my keys on the hook. And then I walk in the kitchen and I, and I drop them there, right? And then I go off and I do something else. And now I'm like, where are my keys, right? I give, I give my wife a hard time. She does. She does. She's the opposite. She, she will put her keys. They could be anywhere. Who knows mm -hmm. where, where they are. Mm -hmm. Mine are always in the same spot. So, you know, what I've done is I've made, I've made a habit that it, it eliminates the thought, right? It, 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 because the thought in that situation of where should I put my keys this time is actually detrimental to me. It makes it much more likely that I'm going to have a negative result. Right. And, you know, in law enforcement, you know, I talk about shaking hands. So, you know, one of the things that I don't do, and this was pre pandemic, it has nothing. I'm not a germaphobe. I don't care about stuff like that, but I don't shake hands because my, my hand shaking hand is my right hand, which is also my, my weapon hand. Mm -hmm. And so if I give up my hand to somebody, I've now put myself in a potentially dangerous situation. Now, most people would say, but you know, not everybody's dangerous. That's kind of overkill, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you can figure out like this person I maybe shouldn't shake hands with. This person is okay to shake hands with. Mm -hmm. But the reality is exactly, right? You're using, when you're doing that, you may be using faulty logic. Well, this person is dressed nicely and they look, they look nice. So they're probably safe. Mm, is that the best criteria for deciding if someone's safe? I don't know, right? It doesn't, eventually- if it were so easy, there would not be any betrayal and crime in the world. <laughs> so. Right. And eventually I'm going to make the wrong decision. Eventually over the course of a career, I'm going to make the wrong decision. And at one time has some pretty, can have some pretty significant results. So I made a rule. I don't shake hands. I, I don't, when I'm in uniform, when I'm on duty and I'm working as, as a police officer, I don't shake hands. I, you know, and, and I'll, and someone will put their hand out to shake my hand. I do fist bumps. I'd be like, hey, is that all right? And we do a fist bump and I'll, you know, use my left hand and, uh, and nobody's ever offended. Uh, everybody, you know, it's always, you know, they get a chuckle and they, they don't mind. But what it does is it makes it so that I don't, I don't have to think every time. Is this safe? Is this not safe? Right. And so, you know, as we move forward, you know, in business, we want to look for ways. How do we, you know, make the things that we should always be doing a habit so we don't have to think about it all the time? And because when we think about it, that's when things go wrong. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, the thing is uh, in business, you have to organize um, a lot structurally so that you don't have to think about it. But on the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, I think it also adds a little bit to this laziness, complacency problem because uh, people start falling asleep then when they, I mean, when they do, when they organize 100%, the days 100%, so they have always the same routine. Yes. Uh, they're getting less and less aware of uh, the changes that happen in the environment. How do you see that? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And that's, that's the yin and the yang. So I, mm -hmm. I, I talk about that in the book. So, you know, you want to automate the things where thought gets in the way, right? But you want to make sure that you disrupt the things where thought is required, right? You want to make sure that you are still remaining aware, Right. And that's the difference between a routine and a habit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to have both. You want to have, you know, habits which remove thought. Right. So when we have a habit, we don't even have to think about it. We just do it. Right. And that's where thought can actually get in the way. But you want to have routines and you want to have things that are built in to make sure that we remain aware in the places that, that we need. And that for every business is going to be different. Right. So if you've ever been in a warehouse, or, or a factory or something like that, you know, you've got, you know, because complacency is such a danger, you're doing repetitive tasks over and over. You can get on autopilot. We then have to disrupt that with sounds. We have to disrupt that with signs, right? Mm -hmm. We have to build disruptions into that to make sure that we remain in the moment and re remain aware. And so you have to do that in business too. We have to make sure that we are, you know, automating the things where thoughts can get in the way, but also disrupting in, in the situations where, you know, not thinking can actually get us into trouble and we can become, uh, you know, unaware of potential dangers. Yeah, deep breaths, uh, deep breaths, as you mentioned before, might be one thing to disrupt business routines. So it's always uh, reconsidering, rethink, is this business really on the right track? Or are we already going in the wrong direction? Is that agreeable for you? 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That That's part of it. That's part of it. I mean, you know, you think about, uh, you know, other things that other industries do. I mean, pilots have checklists, right? Right. They have things that they have to go through because, they, you know, autopilot, they can get on autopilot, right? And forget about, you know, did I check everything that I have to check? Because you know what? Most of the time, everything goes right. Every time they get in that cockpit, everything's fine and there's no problems. But if there is a problem, that's a big problem, right? Um, you know, we get into this with uh, people who do, you know, just, you know, other examples, people who do email marketing, mm -hmm. right? How many times do you get an email that goes out and then they get, you get an, an immediate email afterwards? Like, sorry, this was just a test. This wasn't supposed to go out to the whole list or anything like that. That's because somebody was on autopilot. Yeah, Somebody yeah. got so, you know, they do so many emails that they just were just clicking buttons and they weren't in the moment and they made this mistake that turns out to be pretty embarrassing, right? And that's where you have to build in disruption in the system, make sure that there are things that people have to do before that email goes out, that they have to check boxes or they've got to do something physical or, you know, specific to make sure that they're in the moment so that they don't make, you know, those mistakes. And so, yeah, you can build those things in. I talk a lot about how you know the best type of disruption is self-disruption a lot of times you know we're talking about these kind of micro disruptions mm -hmm. in, in you know in, in the workplace or you know in our processes but a lot of times businesses on a macro level get disrupted because they've gone on autopilot and somebody else comes in so if you think about you know everybody talks about kind of netflix and blockbuster Right. And how Netflix kind of upended Blockbuster. But to me, my favorite part of that story is what happened afterwards. Right. What happens afterwards is Netflix has continually disrupted itself, disrupted its own industry uh, to maintain its level of success and to keep it going. And it keeps everybody else, you know, on their, on their toes. Right. Because, you know, first it was all about, you know, how do we get rid of video stores and, and, you know, have people get these discs in the mail that they can send back. And then it went to streaming. Right. And now everybody's scrambling to do streaming. And then it went to original content production so that they're not reliant on, on the production houses. And now everybody's doing content production. And then, you know, Netflix is like, well, where do we go next? Now we're going to go into gaming or we're going to do all these other things, but they're constantly self-disrupting themselves. And so, you know, it, it's at the micro level in terms of making sure, you know, emails and this and that and everything that we do, but it's also at the macro corporate level. How do we build in disruption into our system so that we don't get comfortable and overconfident? I totally agree with that. I mean, you bring great examples. Um this uh, getting the habits right or getting uh, the right habits, um, knowing or deciding what must go on autopilot. And on the other hand, uh, staying aware and uh, <laughs> I would not say really woke or awakening because we are on the, on the wrong foot then, but uh, uh, staying vigilant. I mean, it's your term that you coined um, and being aware that the environment is constantly changing and uh, this creates then the successes that you mentioned. I mean, you said Apple, Netflix, they would also add Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Bezos has doing uh, was doing a great job. I mean, in the 90s, he started out as an online bookstore. And at, when I was at the university in from 1995 to 2000, and they brought up the Amazon example outside this university environment when I uh, studied economics and business management, everybody mm -hmm. laughed at Jeff Bezos about Jeff Bezos because I mean, who needs an online bookstore when you right. have bookstores around the corner? Why should you go online when you cannot go outdoors? Yeah. Um, now nobody laughs anymore because many of nope. those bookstores are not existing. Um, but Jeff Bezos didn't stop there uh, because at one point in time, he realized that books are not uh, sufficient to create lasting successes. So he tapped into other areas. And I think one story that was quite remarkable was that he started collaborating with Toys R Us which was the beginning of the end of Toys R Us, mm. on the other hand, because, I mean, they outsourced uh, the whole delivery to Jeff Bezos. And at one point in time, Amazon just took over the entire market and Toys R Us was gone. Yep. So finding this, this, this right balance between what must go on autopilot and on the other hand, where should you stay aware on the micro and macro level is what creates a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. You're 100% right. No, it's, it's really a great book. Um, in other chapters, let's go a little bit further. So on, one thing is creating the right habits. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then you wrote a whole chapter about accountability and transparency. Yes. Why is that so important in that context? Oh man, it is, it is so important. It is so important because of what we, we talked a little bit about it at the beginning. And this is something that, again, I've learned from law enforcement. And so I got into law enforcement late in life. I already had, you know, uh, 45 years of living under my belt. Mm -hmm. I'm different than, you know, a 21 year old getting, you know, I just not better or worse. I just look through a different lens. Right. And so, you know, one of the things that has been obvious to me since, you know, and this all started before I got into law enforcement is, you know, how big of an issue accountability and transparency is right. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I, I, it really got, focused for me in law enforcement, but, you know, same thing in business, same thing in government, same thing everywhere. And what has happened is, you know, the more power that you enjoy, the more likely you are, again, to not take accountability for things and to not provide transparency. And when we don't do that, what we do is we lose trust, right? And the first thing that happens when we lose trust is we lose the benefit of the doubt. So the benefit of the doubt comes from, you know, that used to be something that we had. We don't really have the benefit of the doubt anymore. We immediately assume everybody's doing wrong things when we don't have all the information, right? Because that's the way we think these days. Um, and that's, that's a toxic relationship. And so the way to combat that and to wait and the way to make sure that we are not abusing power as we, um, as we get the power is to make sure that we are always, you know, providing public accountability for ourselves and for everything that we do and providing transparency around all of that. And what that does is that forces us to remain aware of what we're doing. It forces us to remain in the moment because we know that we're going to have to tell people what we did and why we did it. So the other thing that goes with that is what we talked about in terms of articulating the why and what that relates to in a business setting is having a purpose. You know, we talk a lot about having mission and vision statements. To me, the most important statement is the purpose statement. Why are we here? What are we doing? And what are we, what are we, uh, you know, what is our reason for being beyond making money? It can't just be making money. That's not mm -hmm. it. Why are we actually here? And when you have a true purpose, you can make sure that everybody within the organization understands that purpose. And it makes it easier to answer the whys. Why are we doing this versus that? because it relates back to our purpose. Why are we making decision B versus decision C? Because that fits with our purpose and decision C doesn't fit with our purpose. And then we bubble that back up in transparency and tell people about it. We make sure that people are aware. You know, we have, um, you know, I, I talk about a couple of companies in the, in the book that have, you know, gone a hundred percent towards salary transparency. So these, these are agencies that have said, you know what, we have a salary gap, right? So they hold themselves accountable and they say, we know that there's a salary gap between genders, right? Males are getting paid more than females. And we are going to publicly let people know that we are going to try and fight that. This is a part of our goal. Our goal is, and we're going to, we're going to put it out there publicly. We're going to hold ourselves accountable and say, we want to bridge that gender gap. And then what they do is they don't just say that. Now they provide transparency. They publish on their website, every employee's salary, every employee's salary from the top. Every, really every employee's salary. Every employee's salary from the top to the bottom including the location, you know, what city they're in. So you can do, so you can compare that as well. But, and not, so, but not with names, I guess. So it's... Uh, no, with names. With names, really. With name. They absolutely publish every... Uh, it's in the book. Yeah. So it, every, every employee's thing. And so now, like, it's all out there, right? You can't mm -hmm. hide from it. So now they'll be the first to admit that they haven't bridged that gap yet. But every year they provide a report on it. Every year they say, here's where we're going with it. Here's what we're trying to do differently. Here's how we're trying to recruit you know, different people. Here's how we're trying to make sure that people are paid equitably, right? And so, and, and here's where we are. Here's every salary with every employee. There's no hiding from it anymore. You know, in, in law yeah. enforcement, it's body cameras. I think it's about trust. That is, that is, that's a, that's a lot about trust, right? Because when you provide that 
you don't leave questions, right? Mm -hmm. but a lot of times what we do is we leave questions in people's minds. Like, and when they don't get all the information, again, because over the years, we've eroded trust between individuals and corporations and between individuals and governments and between individuals and everybody else, we've eroded all this trust. So when we don't have all the information, our default is to assume the worst. They're hiding from us. They're not giving us the information because they don't want us to know, right? Because they're doing something wrong. And this, again, is super evident in law enforcement, right? We now, you know, I've been, ever since I started my career in law enforcement, I've been wearing a body camera. I love the body camera. The body camera is, I would never work without it because it, it you know, it provides that transparency that honestly works out in my favor because, you know, it, it kind of negates any, any false claims about, you know, anything that I did. And I've had that happen to me several times in the past. And we go to the body camera and it's like, nope, this is what happened, you know, but more importantly, it provides trust because people now know that, you know, and, and you'll see when we have incidents, when people don't have body cameras, the initial response is, what are they hiding? Like they were doing something wrong. Right. And that's because there's a lack of trust. Um, so accountability plus transparency equals vigilance. I call it the ATV model. And it forces us by being out there public and, and publicly stating what we're going to stand for and what we're going to try to accomplish. And then providing people with the transparency as to how we're doing that. We, number one, make sure that we remain vigilant because we're holding ourselves in that position where we know we have to be. But the, the nice bonus to that is it builds trust. I couldn't agree more to your statement. And I think this is probably the reason why podcasts these days and also YouTube streaming are such powerful tools because I mean, when people are alive, they are alive, so they can't fake anything. Yeah. And looking at, for example, the, the, the famous podcasters from the United States, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, for example, he puts, he goes to an extent where he really puts his personality out there uh, on display with all the swearing. Uh, that is his yeah. personality. Um, Jamaf Bali Habatia, for example, takes it from another angle. It's from the All In podcast. Uh, I think lately made some comments that were not very well received on the internet about mm. uh, certain population groups in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all out there. So there was a huge debate on uh, Twitter about this incident. And he used it then to excuse, to uh, make an excuse and explain what his motivation was. And I think that actions and reactions that uh, interplay between the audience and the speaker and also when the speaker realizes okay here maybe i was wrong mm. <laughs> helps uh, to create trust and it's also uh, evolves around these two terms that you tackle accountability and transparency absolutely absolutely i i think you know by doing that you put yourself out there you know listen you mentioned gary vanderchuk i mean nobody There's no question that that he is who he is, right? Take it or leave it. You know, like it or don't. It doesn't matter to him, right? And and he's going to lay it all out there. He's 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 not he's, you know, the epitome of transparency uh in terms of his personality, right? Um but, you know, like like we talked about, that has two benefits. Number one is it builds trust um because people, you know, feel like they're they're always getting the right story from you and and they, you know, with trust comes the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. You know, if Gary Vanerchuk said something that was misinterpreted and Gary came out and said, "Hey guys, this is not what I meant." Like if this was people would believe him, mm -hmm. right? Because he's built that trust in terms of saying, "I am what I say I am." Right? When other people come up with excuses on the back end and they haven't built that trust, they haven't provided that transparency, it's not trusted as much. People don't believe it as much, right? It sounds more like a made up excuse on the back end. Um, and that's, that's the difference. But, you know, but the real difference is by doing all that stuff, it forces us to remain aware. Like, you know, if I do something, if I have power in a relationship and I do something and I know I'm never going to have to answer to anybody, right? it becomes more likely that I'm going to do things maybe without even recognizing it, right? I talk about the fact that it's a slippery slope. Without accountability and transparency, we have no friction, mm. right? And so, you know, there's nothing kind of keeping us. And so, you know, that's why a lot of powerful people, they get, you know, yes people around them who are always telling them they're right and always telling them, right? So there's no, there's nothing, there's no friction there. 
there's nothing preventing them from, you know, from taking, you know, advantage. Like, why are we, why are we putting these terms on our vendors? Because we I can. Think, I, I, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. But, but I think uh, staying vigilant, this is one point, probably the emotional part that's also important to talk about. Uh, it's not a comfortable road. So it's, it's not really a comfortable process to stay vigilant and have people around yourself or myself uh, who are telling constantly what other people are doing wrong or what should be changed. Do you, do you see that the same, same way or do we have a different perspective? No, I see it the same exact way as you. Our, you know, we talked about this a little bit er earlier is that, you know, it is way more comfortable for us to be complacent, yeah. right? That, that feels good. That's, mm -hmm. that's comfortable. Vigilance requires effort. And that's mm -hmm. why, you know, what I talk about in a book is how do we institutionalize vigilance? Mm -hmm. How do we build things into our processes, into our businesses and into our lives that, you know, make it more likely that we are going to be vigilant, right? Because, because it is difficult and we avoid things that are difficult. Most of us do. Most of us do. It's just human nature. You know, we rather take the easier path. Um, and that's just subconscious. That's just, you know, without even thinking about it. So it's important for us to think about it ahead of time when we're not in these crisis situations and build it into the way that we work so that we're building that vigilance in so it doesn't become so daunting. I mean, mentioning building vigilance into a business system. Um, when, when I look at it from the financial side, uh, it's always good to have some metrics or some measures mm -hmm. in a business to also then measure the outcome of, let's say, vigilant activities or vigilant structures. Uh, do you have ideas how businesses can measure that? Is there a, are there any metrics out there that would help? Well, the metrics are going to be different for everybody, but I have a whole chapter about metrics uh, in the book. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, where I come at metrics is that, you know, the, the chapter is called just because there's no blood doesn't mean there's no bleeding. Okay. Right. And, and, you know, that's, that's something that I picked up in, in, in the job, you know, working law mm -hmm. enforcement. But the reality is that metrics can be just as helpful as they can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because we could be using the wrong metrics, right? We could be using the right metrics in the wrong way, or we can be using too many metrics, mm -hmm. or we could be using metrics that can be gamed or fooled, right? And when we, you know, so metrics have this kind of, they can tell us what we want and what we need, but sometimes we use them as what, uh, you know, an author by the name of Eric Rees would call vanity metrics. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we create metrics that just give us answers that make us feel good. I mean, you know, Eric, Eric Reese, I think I have one of his books here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? I mean, this one. There you go. Yeah. So he talks about, he talks about vanity metrics, mm -hmm. you know, metrics that we set up that, you know, allow us to give ourselves a pat on the back. Right. So, you know, you know, in my business, so I, you know, I also have a business where we do marketing conferences and we've been doing that for 20 mm -hmm. years. And, you know, when we, you know, at the beginning, you know, we were doing a lot of website stuff and we would get really excited by, you know, sending out emails and how many, you know, opens we'd get or, you know, whatever, or how many clicks we'd get. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that, you know, clicks for us was a vanity metric. What was really important where we should have been focusing on was conversion, right? Because clicks don't mean anything if you can't turn them into something real. And so, you know, in your business, you have to make sure that you're focusing on the metrics, not just the metrics that make you feel good, but the metrics that actually give you actionable information yeah, that's true. That, that, you can, that you can work on. And, but you also want to make sure that you're using metrics, especially in, a, in an organization that's based on sales or, you know, things of that sort where you have this workforce that you're, that you're incenting based on their metrics. You want to make sure that those metrics do not set you up for failure, that they don't put you in a situation where people are forced to do things to meet the metrics that are not conducive to long-term success. Um, you know, I tell a story in a book, it's called the Cobra effect. I call this the Cobra effect. Have you heard this before? No, not yet. Not yet. Tell me more. Okay. About it. So I'll tell you real quick. So the Cobra effect comes from colonial India. Mm. Okay. And in colonial India, they had a Cobra problem. And so what the government did is they created a bounty on cobras. So anybody who brought in a dead cobra would get 
a certain amount of money. And this was meant to clean up the Cobra problem. But what the enterprising people of, of you know, Delhi did is they started breeding Cobras, mm. <laughs> right? So they started breeding Cobras so that they'd have more Cobras to kill so they could collect more bounties. Now, the metric looks great. Look how many Cobras we're killing. But the reality is that, it, that the problem. <laughs> it, it created a worse problem, right? So mm -hmm. they did away with, with the bounty and then everybody had all these Cobras that they had nothing to do with. So they released them and they had a far worse problem than they ever had when they started. And you want to think about that in your business. Am I using metrics that encourage people to game the system at the detriment of the organization so that they can meet their metrics, right? And so metrics can be super helpful Mm. but they can also be dangerous if they're used incorrectly. That's absolutely true. I mean, let's just think about investment world, for example. I mean, our companies, when they are successful, uh, of course, they have the right metrics, but what do you do then when the uh, environment changes? Um, you yeah. mentioned the, the event management business. Uh, I think it was a well-going and well-growing industry until March 2020. And yeah, from so one good. day to the other, <laughs> how, 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 how did your business do during the pandemic? Yeah, terrible, terrible. Mm -hmm. Listen, this is, this is part of, you know, part of what I write about in the book is my own experience yeah. in terms of yeah. our own complacency. You know, we should have been prepared for something like that, but we weren't, we weren't prepared. Things were going along fine with live events. And then all of a sudden in a moment, live events went away. Like one day that we were having them, the next day we weren't. And so we were forced to pivot and to, you know, learn how to do what we're doing now. We, you know, we've, we've done our events virtually for the last couple of years. Uh, and we had to learn a lot in terms of how do we do that and do that in a way that actually provides value to people. Um, but yeah, it was, it's been devastating to the live event business. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we'll ever recover, to be honest with you, because things have changed. The world has changed, you know, we're, we're, I don't know if we're ever going back to where we were, you know, with certain events, yes, but other events, no. Um, and you know how it is in business. You know, once you, once you lose your budget for something, getting that budget back is a little tough. So people have not That's gone true. to certain events for two years now, and they've figured out other ways to get their information and do things and their value proposition has changed. And so, you know, all of a sudden when things open up and we can all travel, you know, freely and don't have to wear masks and all this stuff again, I'm not so sure some of that other stuff is coming back because the world has changed. People have been exposed to new and different things. No, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I think um, before 2020, also in the part of the industry I'm working in, it was normal to travel to conferences mm -hmm. and uh, meet people there, start um, the business relationship with exchanging business cards. And a lot of uh, in the digital world uh, has been built around that, um, that first you meet people in real life and then you go online and then you add them, for example, on LinkedIn. And then a funny story that I experienced last week with LinkedIn since the pandemic uh, shut everything down and uh, I was at my last conference in November 2019. So it's way back. Yeah. Um, I started to learn how to use the digital tools to reach out to people and get to know people. I mean, like Lauren Bolt, for example, she recommended that we should talk, we should go on a podcast. Now we have our conversation. Um, before, we probably would have met at a conference first and right. then talked about, let's uh, jump on a podcast and talk about your book. Uh, now we just use the digital world. And the funny thing with LinkedIn was, since I realized that, I, of course, started contacting people on LinkedIn to say, okay, I mean, uh, this might be a fit. So why not just add this person uh, as a contact, drop a message and say, look, I'm doing this and that. I saw on uh, your profile, you're doing that and that. And let's have a 30 minute Zoom call. Maybe something comes out of it. And if not, we had a nice call and we can move on. Right. Since I started doing that, uh, LinkedIn reminded me last week uh, that I um, connect to too many people. It's far beyond average. <laughs> and I should only connect to people that I know in real life. And I thought, come on, guys. We you can't meet people in real life anymore. Pandemic, how should I do that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. And LinkedIn is going to have to change the way they think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, we can't meet people in real life anymore, especially across borders and, you know, across the world. 
Like that's just not happening anymore. This is you've adapted, and LinkedIn is kind of lagging behind a little bit. It was a, it was an interesting comment. I didn't expect that, especially from uh, digital platforms. And I think this digital world and uh, putting content out there, especially via podcasts, is a great tool to start building trust on one hand. Yeah. And also meeting new people. And I think this will stay not uh, only in the B2C world, I think also in the B2B world, the business to business world, uh, this will be integrated. And who would have thought about it two years ago? Yeah. And, and you know, again, things are changing and they will, you know, I don't think it's ever going back to the way it was. Uh, and we already have a new generation that is coming up that is coming up through all this. Right. So, you know, I, I think about my kids who are just as comfortable going to school online as they are going into school. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their definition of what a friend is, is very different than what my definition of what a friend is. Right. And that's, that's going to change. I'm curious. What's the difference between the definitions? Well, a friend for me is someone that I can count on that mm -hmm. someone that I know that knows me that has insight into my life. Right. So my definition of friends is a very small, small universe. You know, my kids definition of friends is anybody who's, you know, on their Snapchat, you know, or, you know, or anybody who's on their Instagram and is like the photo of theirs as they swipe through. Mm -hmm. So very different definition of what friends are. Um, and so, you know, very different moving forward, what that's going to mean in terms of how people interact and what relationships are like. And, and all those things. So again, you know, I think, I think it was coming anyways, but, you know, just like in a lot of things that have happened in our lives, this pandemic has, you know, put a microscope to things and accelerated um, and, you know, pushed us in a direction that we were heading anyways, but we have to get there a lot faster. No, I agree with that. I mean, uh, the digital world is one, the metaverse is one outcome of that. So two years I started the first podcast experiment two, three years ago before the pandemic. And the problem was in the B2B environment, almost nobody used the internet or the digital possibilities really to do business. So right. especially in the pharma industry, mostly when it comes to business development and financing, everything relied on personal contacts, meeting people in reality, exchanging emails, of course, having phone calls, of course. But I would say 90% of the business encounters were in real life. Mm -hmm. And this was the fear I had in March 2020 when Austria and Europe went on the first lockdown that uh, nothing will happen unless the politicians go back to normal. Mm. But the opposite happened. Uh, when I look on uh, venture capital, for example, capital, de capital deployed into companies, um, the investment world just went on. Um, not as usual, they accelerated the processes. They invested in more company in uh, run by people they yeah. never met before. And this yeah. is an interesting development because it's such a huge shift in values. Before it was, you don't give money to somebody who you never met in real life. Right. And right. now after March, 2020, okay, we go on a Zoom call, it's fine. Let's invest. Do you see it similar? Yeah, I, you know, I don't play in that world, so I, I don't know. I mean, it sounds reasonable to me. I mean, it, you know, it also sounds dangerous, right? Because, you know, again, it's this different definition of what, you know, knowing somebody mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the reality is that, you know, we are not, you know, and a lot of times you know, we are not our public personas, right? We are, you know, there's more to us to that. So I do think eventually we're going to have to find some balance. And I think, I think investors are like, Hey, we've got money. We got to invest and they're looking for ways to do it. And they're doing the best they can. You know, eventually I think it's going to maybe get rolled back a little bit to say, you know, we can't ever go back to where we were, where, where, you know, where everything is in person all the time, but also just making decisions based on what we see online is maybe not also the best choice because, you know, you can't learn everything about people that way that you, you only get their best face forward, right? Their best foot forward in terms of uh, what you see about people, you know, how many times have we like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good about like making sure I keep mm -hmm. my, my uh, profile picture up to date, you know, like I don't have a head of hair anymore. So, I mean, you know, how, how, how weird would it be if like, you know, the picture you had seen of me on LinkedIn was like from 30 years ago. And then all of a sudden I show up looking like this, but it happens all the time still, right? Mm -hmm. People are still, you know, doing that. And so, you know, that's where we get into, it makes accountability and transparency even more important because we don't have that's the true. opportunity to do that vetting ourselves. 
I mean, when I remember Gary Vaynerchuk's advice is uh, put content on online at scale and don't worry too much. Just take pictures from how you are, who you are, uh, post videos, conversations. And I believe that this part of the pandemic will stay in business that people, when they start now searching, had uh, before Christmas, I did um, a year in review with business partners. And I asked uh, some people that are uh, over 60, uh, how they deal with the pandemic and they completely changed their, their search pattern. So they mm. don't start out in real life anymore. They start digitally, they, they do their research. They want to see pictures and videos and podcasts yeah. and they integrate that into their decision-making processes. Yes. So my, my belief is everybody who stays complacent to use your terminology and say, ah, okay, I have this LinkedIn picture for 30 years now. It's good enough. It worked the last 30 years. Um, and who doesn't become vigilant, maybe also that works that are diverted on from you. Uh, will have, in my opinion, a hard time in the coming five years, especially with the young generation who are used to Snapchat, who are used to Facebook, yeah. who are used to meeting people online first and then in real life. Yeah, it, it, I mean, listen, the cycle continues. The, you know, Whoever is succeeding right now in this new world that, that is happening with the, with the online and the virtual, they are just as at risk of becoming complacent, of getting comfortable, of not seeing the fact that things will change again. Mm -hmm. And the decisions you make today in terms of how you do that could come back and haunt you later, right? You have to be able to understand that, yes, you know, we can do things this way for now, but eventually it'll change. And so that's where you have to scenario plan. That's where you have to keep yourself in the moment. That's where you have to debrief. That's where you have to have accountability and transparency. That's where you have to do all these things with the main purpose of staying aware staying vigilant and making sure you don't get overconfident based on short-term, you know, situations. That's absolutely right. Len, I have to have uh, a look at the clock. It's 10 minutes uh, to 5 p.m. here in okay. Austria. Yes. Uh, I could go on endlessly chatting with you. We had an amazing <laughs> conversation. Uh, let me ask you one question at the end. Uh, is there a topic that you would have liked? to talk about and I didn't ask you so far. Is there something open that you would like to share with the audience? No, I mean, I think you've, you've done a great job. You're a great interviewer and, and, and I love the questions that you asked and the direction you've taken it. You know, I would just uh, encourage people, you know, you can learn more about me at my website and, and, and my book. It's really easy. My, my name is on the page there. It's just lenherstein.com um, and you can learn all about it. And the book is called Be Vigilant strategies to stop complacency, improve performance and safeguard success. Um, and it's available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or wherever you buy, uh, you know, books, wherever you are in the world. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I like to leave people with is this idea that success is not the end goal. Mm -hmm. Keeping it is right. And that's what this book is about. There's a lot of people out there who will talk about and help you understand how you can become successful the book Be Vigilant is for those who have enjoyed success, who are looking to make sure that they keep it. Len, thank you very much for this closing statement. Uh, I agree to everything you say. It was a great conversation. Thank you very Thanks, much Christian. for spending your time to give more insights into your book. And I encourage everybody who is listening to this episode, buy the book. It's worth reading. Yeah, I appreciate it. I've had a great time. And I also encourage people to just reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, find me on LinkedIn and, and connect with me. I love, you know, we talk about these virtual, you know, meeting people virtually. This is, I, I love it. So please do so. Len, I wish you, your family and your team a great 2022. And let's you catch too. up soon. Have a great Sounds day. Sounds great. <laughs> Thanks, Chris.